Hi, everybody. This is Bonnie Goldstein. Welcome to another episode of Cannabis is Medicine. In this video, we're going to be talking about CBDA. What is CBDA? If you're not familiar with me, I'm a, a pediatric trained uh, California licensed physician. Um, I trained at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and I went into the field of critical care transport and emergency medicine. Uh, for many years. And then in 2008, I shifted gears and became interested in cannabis after a friend of mine uh, used it for um, uh, side effects of chemo. And I found it to be quite interesting and I became quite intrigued and I haven't looked back since. I'm involved in a number of things in the industry, as you can see, and then you can see the cover of my book here called Cannabis is Medicine, which came out in September, 2020 and is a uh, available uh, online if you want to order it. Um, let's talk about CBDA. So CBDA stands for cannabidiolic acid. It was discovered in 1940 and it was thought to be inactive initially. And CBDA uh, results when CBGA is exposed to an enzyme called CBDA synthase. So CBGA is kind of known as the mother to all phytocannabinoids. And again, when it's exposed to this enzyme, it converts to CBDA. CBDA is what occurs in the raw plant. Uh, when, it's har when it's harvested, you can see it in both hemp and in the uh, cannabis that does contain some THC. Uh, and when CBDA is decarboxylated or heated up, it converts to CBD. So it is the precursor uh, to CBD. By definition, if you buy a bottle of CBD oil, that means it started off as raw, plant with CBDA and was heated up in, uh, in the process, resulting in the CBD. Now we know CBDA is understudied. And so if you look at these uh, charts here, well, first of all, here's uh, CBDA and then heat, light, and storage. You lose a carbon and two oxygens and that gives you CBD. Um, but this slide is really meant to show you just how understudied CBD is, I'm sorry, CBDA is. So if you look here, CBD, 600 publications as we go up here, increased number of publications. And as you can see, little research through the 80s, through the 90s, through the early 2000s. And then right around 2010, 2013, we start to see this very big spike in CBD. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that uh, parents of children with intractable epilepsy were kind of using CBD and scientists decided to um, follow up and, and do the research to see if it really uh, does work for those indications. And then there were other indications as well, like inflammation and neurodegenerative disorders and cancer. So 600 research articles um, just in the last couple of years per year. And then as you see here, CBDA, its peak was at 30. So only 30 articles at, at its peak. Uh, but certainly uh, quite interesting so far. And then if you look at this radial chart, you can just see very easily that CBD research takes up all of this territory here and CBDA is like a little speck of sand right there. So um, certainly we need more research because this compound is very promising and uh, preliminary results show some really interesting medicinal benefits. Um, with very little side effects. I'm also started using it in some of my patients and I'm seeing some benefits as well, which we'll get to uh, towards the end of the uh, talk. So let's talk about mechanism of action. So remember these compounds from uh, cannabis, these phytocannabinoids, they're well known to be what we call promiscuous molecules, meaning they target many different places in the body. There's like a stacking of effects. It's not just uh, one place that they work. So in terms of the endocannabinoid system, endocannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors. What we know about CBDA is it blocks the uptake of anandamide and it blocks the breakdown of 2-AG anandamide and 2-AG are two of the main endocannabinoids, your inner cannabis-like compounds that play a role in homeostasis and balancing of many different uh, physiologic systems. So CBDA in, this, um, in these effects enhances your endocannabinoid system by uh, prolonging the effects of anandamide 2-AG. As far as we know, um, CBDA does not appear to have any interaction at either type 1 or type 2 cannabinoid receptors. Uh, we know that CBDA works at serotonin receptor, the 5-HT1A. Um, it's an indirect agonist at this site, meaning it, it stimulates the site, but not directly the uh, receptor. 
Uh, and in terms of its effects at this receptor, it's anti-nausea, anti-vomiting, and anti-anxiety based on a number of uh, reports. Um, we also know that CBDA showed much higher affinity for this receptor than CBD, which would allow for a lower dose to do have a similar uh, result um, as a higher dose of CBD might have. And then uh, TRIP, uh, the TRP channel, so transient receptor potentials. I've talked about this in my CBG uh, uh, video. CBDA activates the TRIP V1 channels. These are important in pain reduction and anti inflammatory effects. CBDA activates TRIP A1, again, involved in pain and sensory signaling. And then CBDA blocks uh, the TRIP M8, which is a receptor also activated during pain and inflammation and also in cold sensitization, as well as um, cellular growth in terms of cancer. So, again, CBDA has, you can see, multiple sites of action. Uh, not just uh, one place where it works. Now, I'm just going to talk about the COX enzymes. This has been kind of an area of, of research. So COX enzymes are these enzymes that are very, play a very important role. And what they do is they convert arachidonic acid in our cells, in our bodies, to prostaglandins. And that's what the PG is here. And we have COX-1 and we have COX-2. And recently, a COX-3 was uh, discovered. And so prostaglandins are these compounds we make, they're fatty uh, compounds, lipids, and they're made at the site of tissue damage or infection, and it's invo they're involved in injury and illness, and they control processes such as inflammation and blood flow and blood clotting, and also are involved in uh, labor and childbirth. So they play a very important role. And basically what it's important to understand the reason I want to show you this is because NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, over-the-counter like ibuprofen or naproxen, there's also um, uh, prescription NSAIDs that you can get that are a little bit stronger. They have risky side effects in terms of uh, GI upset, so they can um, irritate the uh, lining of your stomach. They can cause ulcers in some people. Uh, they also can have cardiovascular uh, negative effects like heart attack or stroke. And there's even warnings on these um, over-the-counter medications and some prescription that say, you know, be careful because of these uh, effects. And that's because NSAIDs are not selective. They block both COX-1 and COX-2. And COX-1 is very important in tissue homeostasis and making sure the stomach, the intestines, kidneys, platelets all function properly. So when you take an NSAID, you're interfering with that. Um, and so there was a category of drugs that come out called selective COX-2 inhibitors. They exist. Um, however, it looks like um, CBDA plays a role at these COX enzymes. Now these are um, uh, test tube studies. So CBDA was found to inhibit COX-2, so be a selective COX-2. So leave COX-1 alone, let it do its thing, protective and healing, um, but block the prostaglandins that cause all this inflammation. And that was uh, found in 2008, these anti-inflammatory effects from CBDA. But then another study a few years later contradicted this. And in that study, they also found CBD to potentially inhibit COX-1. So we don't know really. Um, are the anti-inflammatory effects of CBDA come from the TRIP v, the TRIP v1 or uh, TRIP-A1 channels, or does it come from COX? Does it come from both? Uh, this is a big question and certainly more research needs to be found, uh, needs to be done so that uh, we can understand exactly how CBDA works uh, in this arena. Now, in terms of cancer, there's a number of studies and I'm not gonna get into too much detail here, but you can see all of these studies are involved with this highly aggressive breast cancer cell line called MDA-MB231. And uh, CBDA was found to inhibit the migration of these cells, so kind of anti-metastatic effects. Um, also, CBDA reduced the COX-2 expression in these um, cancer cells, which potentially uh, working through genes to um, decrease that expression and potentially make them less aggressive. And then these last two studies kind of tell you the mechanism by how they worked. Um, but more importantly, you know, we still really don't know if in humans, if CBDA is beneficial for breast cancer or any other cancer, because this is all test tube work, and we have yet to have anything in animals in terms of CBDA and cancer research, or of course in humans.
Now let's talk about nausea. So in mice, uh, subthreshold doses of CBDA combined with subthreshold doses of THC reduced acute nausea and higher doses of each suppressed what's called anticipatory nausea. That's the nausea that um, sometimes, let's say cancer chemotherapy patients get, they know they're gonna get nauseous because they've already gotten chemo. And let's say on the chemo day, when they go to get their infusion, as they're kind of arriving to the facility and going in, to get their chemo, they already feel a nausea. So that's what's called anticipatory nausea. And it's quite debilitating for people and stressful as you can tell. So um, uh, subthreshold doses of CBDA combined with THC um, reduce nausea. And then if you take a little bit higher dose, we may get suppression of anticipatory nausea. So this is, that again was in mice. Uh, the same group did another study where they looked at subthreshold doses of CBD and THC and CBDA and THC. And um, both uh, combinations reduced vomiting dramatically, suggesting that the combination of cannabinoids may lead to better control. Um, and the CBD dose was higher than the CBDA dose. You're gonna hear me say this a few times in this uh, talk because it appears that CBDA is more potent uh, in a lower dose and CBD at that lower dose is not as effective. So um, it appears that you can get away with taking a smaller dose of CBDA. Uh, and it may be due to its improved bioavailability. And I'll talk about that. Um, and another study, again, the same group in my subthreshold doses of THC or CBDA suppressed acute nausea and the combined administration enhanced positive hedonic reactions, meaning the mice were happier uh, with this combination. And the authors concluded oral administration of subthreshold doses of THC and CBDA uh, may be an effective new treatment for acute nausea and anticipatory nausea and appetite enhancement in chemotherapy patients. So um, I have started uh, encouraging uh, patients to take both of these um, if they're struggling with um, side effects of chemotherapy with uh, nausea and vomiting. Now more research. So in my CBDA was shown to um, have an anxiolytic like effect, which means it decreases anxiety under conditions of high stress. Again, in mice, uh, same thing in mice, CBDA provided a dose dependent antihyperalgesia. What does that mean? So pain reduction and also anti-inflammatory effects when given before, but not, that should say not after 60 minutes after a chemical irritant. So in, combination, in comparison to CBDA, an equivalent low dose of CBD did not reduce pain. And this suggests that CBDA is more potent than CBD for this indication of pain and anti-inflammatory. And when ineffective doses of CBDA alone, so low dose that didn't work or THC low dose that didn't work, when these low doses were combined, this combination did give pain relief and reduced inflammation. And we know this about the entourage effect and synergy that when combined, you might get away with lower doses, which gives you less side effects, um, but enhanced uh, results. So very important to know that this combination seems to be something that people are talking about, CBDA and THC. And then here's a study uh, in terms of seizures. So CBDA uh, significantly increased the temperature threshold at which mice with a Dravet type uh, syndrome genetics had generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So let me explain what that means. So um, Dravet uh, syndrome in humans is um, when there's a genetic abnormality that leads to a very severe uh, type of pediatric epilepsy. And these children have uh, a very low threshold for a uh, change in temperature. So when it's hot out, they have seizures. I have uh, patients in my practice where like all summer long, they stay inside in the air conditioning. They get, if they have to go somewhere, the car is all cooled off before they bring the child out because just ex even short-term being exposed to the heat, they can go into a very bad seizure. So what it was shown in this study that CBDA increased the temperature threshold, meaning these mice that had Dravet were able to tolerate higher temperatures. So that's very interesting. If someone's taking CBDA with Dravet, they may be able to go outside on a summer day. Also, what they found in this study, they looked at brain penetration of CBDA. And um, we've heard from researchers in the past that CBDA as well as THCA have difficulty penetrating the blood-brain barrier because of their structural, um, their chemical structure. 
And they compared in this study CBDA that was in an oil base with one that was in an emulsified, uh, like an emulsifier vehicle. And they found that brain penetration was improved with the emulsifier vehicle versus the oil base. So that's important too. Um, and then here's a study that came out just last year in my CBDA exhibited dose dependent protection against seizures at doses comparable, but not more effective than CBD. And they also found that the preparation of CBDA that contained the minor cannabinoids was more effective than CBDA isolate, which is CBDA by itself away from all the entourage effect of the other compounds. So um, two very nice early uh, preliminary research um, that in, um, in the field of uh, epilepsy and CBDA. Now here is a, just a very nice uh, summary that I found for Mato et al published this. Um, so you can see here's CBDA and it gives you the effects. So anti-inflammatory on the gene level, on the enzymatic level and on a receptor level. Also the anti-emetic effects through that serotonin receptor, anti-convulsant effects, and then these anti-cancer effects, again, in test tube and just in breast cancer so far that we see. So certainly a lot more research to be done on CBDA. Now there has been what we call a CBDA methyl ester research. So what does that mean? CBDA is considered an unstable compound in that it wants to convert to CBD, as to CBD. It readily decarboxylates to CBD. And so if you have a bottle, let's say of 100% CBDA, just sitting there, some of it's going to convert. So it becomes very hard to study. Once it converts a little bit, let's say three weeks into your research, you're still giving your mice CBDA. How, you don't know if that bottle now is containing CBD because some of it may have converted. So your end result, you don't know if you can attribute to CBDA, to CBD, or to both. So researchers wanted to stabilize this compound and they came up with a um, a way to do that. And they created this product called HU580. And what it is is CBDA methyl ester. So they added a methyl ester uh, um, chemical structure to the CBDA. And it turns out that this is a more stable form and, and easier for the researchers to work with. And then uh, here are some studies you could see just, just from a few years ago. So HU580 was more potent than CBDA and enhancing the serotonin receptor activation and inhibiting signs of acute and anticipatory nausea and anxiety. So this is a form of CBDA uh, with the methyl ester and it worked uh, quite well for nausea. Uh, additionally, uh, they found that this um, compound was uh, reduced depression in rats. Uh, also, they found that this compound enhanced extracellular dopamine and serotonin and increased wakefulness and decreased slow wave sleep in rats. There was no effect on the REM sleep, but this is interesting in that some people are talking about CBD being very helpful for sleep. Um, CBDA is increasing wakefulness. So this may not be something you, you would take right before bedtime. Um, now, some people find when their anxiety is down, they can fall asleep easier, but CBDA may not be a direct uh, enhancer of sleep, but it may help with reducing anxiety before you go to sleep. Um, and another study here, this is really interesting. They used both male and female rats, and they found that male rats with neuropathic pain had a dose-dependent pain reduction, meaning as they went up on the dose and they tested numerous different doses, they got a better result with the higher dose with this uh, CBDA methyl ester, but female rats didn't respond to any of the doses. So that's just interesting in and of itself and certainly needs to be explored. And a little bit more in terms of the methyl ester research, very recent. So looking at uh, mice that were either had diet induced obesity or genetically induced obesity. Um, and so this was kind of a model of potter willie syndrome, uh, which is a genetic condition where um, those who have this uh, never feel um, satisfied with food. They're always seeking out food. Um, you know, parents of children like this, they have to put a lock on their refrigerator and the children just eat and eat and eat and become quite obese. The CBDA methyl ester treatment resulted in weight loss, decreased overeating and improved glycemic and lipid profiles, which is really interesting. And additionally, it reduced liver dysfunction and uh, fatty acid, uh, I'm sorry, fatty liver disease. So what's called steatosis. So that's really interesting in and of itself. 
And then I thought this was really interesting too. Um, so cattle that were fed industrial hemp with a high CBDA content for two weeks had increased lying behavior, meaning lying down behavior, not telling lies, and decreased biomarkers of stress and inflammation. This is really interesting. I was wondering why they did this research. And it turns out in the author's report that hemp may present a viable way to mitigate stressful experiences such as transportation and regrouping of cattle. So maybe giving them some hemp with high CBDA just makes their life a lot nicer. Now here, I just wanted to show you the CBDA structure and here's the CBDA methyl ester. And so they just added on this extra carbon and hydrogens to change the structure and stabilize it. And then this is very interesting. Uh, this is a report that came out in January, 2022, looking at cannabinoids potentially blocking cellular entry of COVID into cells and also the emerging variants. And this got a lot of press. This was all over the news. And so the researchers here found that uh, the acidic cannabinoids, so like CBGA, CBDA, and THCA were found to be um, ligands, which means they're like the keys in the lock receptor, not only at the main site, but also at a side site, very important. Um, and this was for the receptors on the spike protein. And that's the spike protein is what makes COVID so infectious and what makes it attach to our cells and penetrate into our cells. Uh, CBGA and CBDA prevented infection of human epithelial cells. This is in a test tube by a pseudovirus expressing the SARS-CoV-2 um, um, spike protein and also prevented entry of live SARS-CoV-2 into cells. Both CBGA and CBDA were equally effective against uh, the alpha variant and also a beta variant, which is really important as well, because as the uh, virus changes, it changes its uh, uh, the chance that your immunity will recognize it and fight it uh, effectively. And so they concluded orally bioavailable and with a long history of safe human use, these cannabinoids isolated or in hemp extracts have the potential to prevent as well treat infection by SARS-CoV-2. And I just wanted to show you, this is kind of how they did it. Here's um, the spike proteins. And you know this looks like a crown, that's why they call it a coronavirus. And then if you narrow in on one of the um, uh, spikes here and you look, they has a number of uh, subunits. And then what they're showing you here is they took the cannabis, um, uh, hemp, and um, they basically um, isolated the various compounds, but did it kind of an all together to be able to look for which compounds in the hemp, remember there's hundreds of compounds in there, but which compounds were able to be ligands or which is like, again, a, a fancy word for the key in the lock of the spike protein. And as you can see down here on the bottom, CBDA uh, was found to be a ligand, CBGA and THCA. And it's interesting, they focused on these two because THCA is actually considered a controlled substance because if you heat it up, it turns to THC. So they focused on CBDA and CBGA. And what this shows you here is the control, the CBDA and the C, uh, CBGA. So let me show you what this is. What's stained blue are the nuclei of cells. So here's a cell here, there's a cell here. So there's a whole bunch of cells. And so also here are these, all these various cells. And what they did was they treated these cells with either a control or CBDA or CBGA. And then when they infected it with the virus, um, the virus goes in and starts to infect the cell and it replicates. The virus enters the cell and replicates. And what you see here, the red in this control, the red is um, basically the virus replication. It's highlighted as red. And as you can see in the CBDA and CBGA, the virus did not replicate and you don't see any evidence of it. So this is really, really exciting research. This came out of Oregon State University. Um, does it indicate that you should take CBDA and CBGA? I don't know the answer to that yet. Certainly these compounds have tons of other benefits. So if you're taking them, great. It may prevent you from uh, getting infected and it may prevent you from getting ill. It's hard to say at this point, again, very preliminary. 
Now, a few more things to know about CBDA. So CBDA is less lipophilic and more water soluble and therefore better absorbed uh, than CBD, what we call more bioavailability. Uh, one report states five to 10 uh, times better absorption of CBDA over CBD. And in that respect, you may save money because you can take a smaller dose of CBDA and get a better result. Uh, CBDA is thought to be significantly more potent than CBD for seizures, inflammation, nausea, and anxiety. And this is based on the research that's um, um, uh, put here. Uh, all of these studies um, came to these conclusions. Uh, we know CBDA is not intoxicating even in very high doses. Uh, I also have shared with you already that CBDA appears to increase the benefits of other cannabinoids. And again, that comes from synergy and the entourage effect. Um, one thing, benefits can take time to appear. I tell people, give it at least a 30-day trial. Um, you can't expect to take two doses and magically feel better. That's just not the way how plant medicine works. If you do get better in two days, that's great. You're one of the lucky ones. But for most people, um, over a period of a month, you may see that pain is down, inflammation is down, anxiety is down. It's, um, and, and keeping a log and keeping notes um, can help in terms of dosing and product and kind of going back and saying, oh, this is when I really saw, when I went to this dose is when I really saw the benefits. So that can be very helpful. And then a very simple way to add to your regimen, if you don't want to uh, go out and seek uh, CBDA in a tincture form, uh, remember you can't inhale this because once you heat it up, it converts to CBD. So you either have to take it as a, um, as a uh, tincture, but some people are finding that you can add it to tea. So you can find high CBDA cannabis flower and put it in tea. And yes, that's heat, but uh, there's quite a bit of CBDA left in that um, uh, tea after you've added it. And um, I heard about this through uh, Dr. Dustin Sulak and I've now um, started sharing this with some of my patients who are reporting um, anti-inflammatory effects um, after a couple weeks on uh, CBDA. And then just some of my clinical findings, just to summarize, I've seen seizure reduction in some of my pediatric patients along the combination with other cannabinoids. I've seen a reduction in anxiety in some of my patients taking it with autism. I've definitely seen a reduction of pain, either alone CBDA or in combination with THC and or CBD. And then I have one patient when we added high dose CBDA uh, to a regimen of CBD and THCA, there was a, um, more reduction of bloody stool and reduced uh, inflammatory markers uh, in terms of uh, lab tests. And then in adult patients, I've treated some gout patients with this. I had uh, one elderly gentleman who found significant reduction of pain with 150 milligrams twice a day. Um, and he's gone to a maintenance dose of about 100 milligrams once a day, which keeps the gout away. I have another elderly gentleman who I've uh, treated for many, many years for another condition who's developed osteoarthritis as he's gotten older with terrible knee pain and 75 milligrams twice a day eliminated his knee pain. And when he tried to cut down on the dose, his pain came back. So clearly he's got, you know, bone on bone, a lot of inflammation going on. And so he's very happy with these results. Uh, he was just trying to save money by going lower on the dose, but um, 150 milligrams uh, total in a day was not too expensive uh, for him. And then um, I had a, um, I have a, a patient who, again, longtime patient with migraines and anxiety who has done really well, but we just added in CBDA and she felt that um, 50 milligrams reduced anxiety significantly. And also her um, migraine episodes reduced by 75%. She still gets probably like one every two months, something like that. And then nausea, um, I have a um, breast cancer patient, again, for, been followed for years, who um, was on high dose THC and CBD. And I think she had developed tolerance to the anti-nausea effect of THC. So we added in a low dose of CBD, I think five milligrams, which eliminated the chemotherapy induced nausea. And she does, she does take it before she gets her chemo and then she uses it after as well. So almost like prophylactic before uh, getting her infusion. So um, very uh, interesting um, clinical findings. And I'm very excited uh, that there's going to be more research. I just hope that we can really uh, figure out because I think this is an absolute treasure of a phytocannabinoid. Uh, last slide here, just to show you various products. So here you have a product that's a tincture, 
CBDA, it's 1500 milligrams of CBDA in one ounce. Here's one that's 750 milligrams in one ounce. Here's one 500 milligrams in one ounce. So you can see you can get different potencies. Here's a salve that you can get um, in you know, a versatile balm with some other stuff in there. And then this one I wanted to show you. So this is a product that's um, been out in California for quite some time. And this used to just, this says 40 to one. So what's that referring to? That's the CBD to THC. So this is a brand that has a number of different ratios for CBD. And what's interesting is that they didn't used to have the CBDA or THCA content on their listed on their product. But I think, you know, they are looking at the same studies that I'm looking at and realize that having some uh, raw cannabinoids like CBDA and THCA, acidic cannabinoids mixed in makes these products more effective. And so here you can see um, 960 milligrams of CBD. So certainly a CBD dominant product, but you also see some significant CBDA, 240 milligrams in that bottle. Um, so very helpful, I think, to get more of a entourage effect. And I have patients that use this product who really are the ones who are super sensitive to THC. They don't like a THC effect. When you have 40 times more CBD than THC, you're not really going to feel that THC, but getting good results. So um, make sure you read labels, make sure you look at COA, certificate of analysis. Um, most CBDA products are, well, I shouldn't say that, but mostly available online because they're considered hemp. They're very low in THC under that 0.3% by weight criteria. Um, but there are also products in licensed dispensaries that are CBDA. But again, always look at the certificate of analysis. If you're not familiar with that, I have a, a, a video on that that you can find on YouTube. Um, but you always want to look at that to make sure your product is clean, that it is what they claim it to be, and that um, it's not, sometimes the labels can be um, misleading. So you want to make sure uh, that you're getting what you're looking for. All right. That's the end of my uh, presentation on CBD. I hope that was helpful for you. And I just wanted to say, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of videos coming down the uh, pipe here. And then also please um, consider uh, buying my book to support uh, all of this great content. Uh, have a wonderful evening to everybody. Stay well and be well.